and welcome back to another video from the Model Guy. In this episode, we'll be tackling the Kinetic CF-18B Hornet. However, there were some issues with the kit, and we'll get into those later. But first, we'll start off with a brief history of the Canadian Hornet. On October 25th of 1982, the first two Canadian CF-18 Hornets were delivered to CFB Cold Lake. The Royal Canadian Air Force needed to replace its Starfighter and Voodoo aircraft, and they looked at potentially at the F-14, F-15, Tornado, Mirage, and the new F-16 and F-A-18. Canada wanted an off-the-shelf proven airframe. Canada also offered to buy Tomcats after the Iranian Revolution, but negotiations were called off when Canadian involvement in the American Embassy crisis became public knowledge. After carefully reviewing their options, the Canadian government chose the F-18 Hornet due to its twin-engine design, affordability, and durability. Single-engine aircraft were dismissed since high Arctic patrols and overwater flights required a second engine for reliability. Being a carrier-based aircraft, the Hornet was designed to be abused. In the end, the Canadian government paid the tab for 62 CF-188s and 18 CF-18Bs, which is the twin-seat version. If you're wondering what the difference is between a Canadian Hornet and other bugs, some are the identification light on the left side of the nose and false canopy under the fuselage. That false canopy was also adopted by the Spanish and Marine Corps for their Hornets, to, and they are designed to confuse the enemy in a dogfight. One other difference that's very minor that you may not know is the landing gear struts feature a different style shock on the Canadian Hornets. The combat history of the CF-18 Hornet makes it a very busy aircraft. In 1991, 26 Hornets were committed to the first Gulf War, even though they were unable to draw precision munitions at the time. Hornets flew 56 bombing sorties during the 100-hour invasion, dropping mainly 500-pound unguided bombs on soft targets. This was also the first time Canadian forces had been involved in combat since the Korean War. In the late 90s, Canadian Hornets twice visited the former Yugoslavia, where during operations Mirador and Echo, 18 Hornets dropped nearly 400 precision-guided munitions on 558 bombing strikes. Since September 11, 2001, Canadian Hornets have responded to 3,000 incursions into Canadian and American airspace. A road trip in 2007 took Canadian Hornets to Alaska, where for two weeks they filled in for United States Air Force F-15 Eagles that were grounded due to structural issues. In 2011, Canadian Hornets were enforcing the Libyan no-fly zone. Five days after they were initially deployed, Canadian Hornets bombed Libyan targets. The seven Hornets that were deployed de made up almost 10% of the NATO strike missions flown. In 2014, Canadian Hornets joined the fight against ISIS by joining Operation Impact. Recently, Canadian Hornets have been deployed to Romania with the NATO air policing mission in the region. And finally, to wrap up some of the Canadian history of the Hornet, in 2018, the government announced that it would be buying 25 used Australian Hornets as a stopgap measure until a new fighter is procured for Canada. The next fighter competition is underway again. Now, let's talk a little bit about the Kinetic Hornet I'm building here. On a single note, it's a good kit. The detail is really nice. It's finely detailed. They've got away from the trench-style panel lines they've had on the F-16 and horribly on the E-3 Hawkeye they've done. Now, there are still some fit issues I've run into with the kit. Mainly, the engine intakes here didn't sit level with the splitter in the front. And unfortunately, that was something that I had to address with putty and a lot of sanding. And you'll see that in this video. With my last couple of kinetic kits I've built, it's a lot of sanding. And the E2 Hawkeye, from my, from my experience with it, may as well have been a block of wood. It, there was huge panel lines. I tried rescribing them. There was lots of gaps. It was just not a fun time. I didn't want to completely put off Kinetic after one kit, so at the local model store, I picked up the F-16i Sufa they made in 148 scale. Initially, I was impressed. Some of the details were a little overdone, little wide panel lines and such. However, the biggest drawback was the CFTs were not in the kit. The fuel tanks for the fuselage were not there, and the SS sprue was missing. So I had to put that kit on hold, and I also had this kit on the shelf at the same time, the CF-18-8 slash B model. I opened that kit up and the decals were missing. So I sent Kinetic an email basically saying, hey guys, look, I have two of your kits here. I'm missing the decals for one and missing two sprues for the other. Their initial reply was, okay, we'll have somebody look into it, but they're not here this week. Not an issue. I waited a week, didn't hear back from them. And after two weeks, I emailed again and said, hey guys, what's the story here? Just wondering if I needed to pay postage 
or if you're going to replace them, what's going on? They replied back that their customer service guy was on vacation. So that was kind of a alarm at this point because now it's been three weeks and I haven't heard anything back from them. I sent a final email. It was pretty Canadian as well. I wasn't too rude in it. It was basically, hey guys, what's the story? Do I need to buy aftermarket stuff or do I just need to take these kits back? I'm not really impressed with how this has been going. And at this point, I don't think I want to do any more of your kits. There was no reply, nothing from that email. And I figured, okay, that's it. The kinetic bug was on the shelf with no decals. The horn and the F-16 was away with missing the key pieces of making an Israeli Viper. So local model club, I'm talking to some people and I could bring up this topic, that hey, I'm missing my decals from the Kinetic Hornet. And my friend Chris comes to the with the win and says, hey, I have the, the Canadian 150 Hornet decals that I didn't use. Do you want them? Initially, I was really reluctant to do those decals. They're pretty involved, and I thought they may be beyond my skills. However, I'm missing decals for the Kinetic bug that I have, so I went for it. I said, all right, I'll go full bill. I'll go full in. Everything's on the table. So now I decide that my twin seat Hornet's actually going to be a single seat, I get the red color I need, check out the decals he gives me. They look nice. They're kind of on the thick side, but I decide to go for it. It might save the day. I start building the model, and as soon as I paint it red, the decals for the Hornet show up from Kinetic, and also the missing fuel tanks and sprue show up from Kinetic. So good on them. They did send me the stuff. I will give them the credit for that. However, I didn't really appreciate that it took so long for it to show up and that they didn't give me any expectations at all. So three months went by before the stuff I was missing showed up. But at the end of the day, I built this Hornet. I really like how it's turned out and I decided I'll give him another chance. And I actually picked up a second Hornet from Kinetic to do. So am I setting myself up for disaster again? No, because the decals are there this time. And I have a spare set of decals. And also having done the kit once, I've now found a few areas that I'm gonna do a little bit in different, in different sequence. The first one being that the intake trunks here I wish I had glued them to the nasal first and then done the intake trunk as one assembly because it took so much to clean up that inside seam. And Duke's models did an excellent review of this kit. I highly recommend that review he's done. And I will 100% agree with him that single piece intake, I would buy it 100% money down. It's needed for this kit. That's the first flaw. Here I'm trying to get the worn sandy color of the engines down. So I've just mixed Citadel paints and just lightly brushing it on. Uh, once I add the wash, you won't see it too much. And even then, once it's all in place, you don't really see it from the back of the aircraft. You really have to put your nose in there. While we're watching these engines come together, one thing I will say that's a plus for Kinetic in this point is with the way the kit's detailed, there's not much you need in aftermarket. I would go with the stock engines for this and all the pit parts, they're all there. The cockpit actually looks really nice out of the box. The only thing you really need to bring this kit really up to par is a set of seat belts. That's it, you can build this out of the box and have yourself a nice kit. There's a lot of detail to work with. And having said that, they give you a lot of ordnance to work with. You can build about three or four Hornets just with the ordnance that comes in this kit. Now we come to the part of the build that's really going to challenge you. I've extended this part just so you can appreciate what you're getting yourself into. The Inner Nerds built this kit. Uh, Takeoff Models has built this kit. They've had beautiful Hornets in the end. But at this point, they just show the kit coming together. And having talked to both those guys, the kit doesn't just come together. The top of the fuselage is not properly aligning with the bottom. You can see the panel lines. They're going to be off by about a millimeter. Something's going on here. Uh, the location pins, when they do finally pop into place on the back side, the panel lines don't line up. And that's going to create an issue because you can either start from the middle, work your way out, start from the back, work your way forward, or start from the front and work your way back. All three of these possibilities do not work with the box kit initially. I didn't want to modify the kit yet, just in case I was missing something, so I did a little bit more research, and then I tried again for a little while to try to get it to fit, and here's how that looked in four times speed. Is it going together yet? No, I'm going to squeeze the middle, try from the middle. Is the middle together? Yep, but the nose won't align. So the middle's together, rear and front don't align. So let's start from the nose. Okay, the nose works, but now it's binding back over the leading edge extensions. That's not going to work. So let's try from the middle and work our way back and then try the nose. Note that's not going to work because now the front's binding like crazy. Am I going to have to shave the nose or cut it like Doug suggests? I didn't want to do anything that drastic yet. So I'm going to keep trying. Still nothing. The middle aligns. I'm going to have to obviously shave this down somewhere. Oh, nope, it's going together. No, it's not because now it's binding on the front and it's hitting. I can't get it to go together. What is going on? 
Now you can see in this clip, I'm just gluing the piece of the fuselage on that turns this into a single seat and the fuselage halves have miraculously come together. Unfortunately, it wasn't a miracle. Things weren't going well with the kit fitting it, so I had to walk away from a night and just go watch some TV and really kind of contemplate what I was doing wrong, why this wasn't working, and start going down the rabbit hole. I had already stopped two previous kinetic builds for issues, and I really didn't want to do it a third time. I wanted to work my way through. So I really studied the kit and how everything was coming together, and I found the issue in the back here. By removing this section of the fuselage on the top half and putting a piece of styrene in there after I fitted everything together, it all came together. It snapped down. But the panel lines in the rear were still slightly misaligned. So the lesser of two evils was for me to fill those panel lines, sand it down, and where the rear stabilizers weren't going to cover, rescribe the lines. So that was my workaround. And I almost lost my mind. I didn't. I prevailed. But just so you know, this kit does not just fall together. Having fought the top and bottom halves of the fuselage, it's now time to clean everything up. So here I am sanding everything down a little bit more. There's a little bit of an overlap from the top half of the fuselage that has to sand down. You'll see that in a few other videos people do to get under the chisel. But the way I forced everything apart with the styrene, I only had to shave a little bit to have that nice fuselage gap. Like any time you build a model kit that's a challenge, there are ups as well. And the biggest up for me was when I first started shooting the red. The Tamiya X red I used here looked amazing. And even though I had the replacement decals show up the next day, I decided to keep pushing forward with the red. Uh, I did very thin, thin coats and slowly built it up for a nice smooth finish. And after about four coats, I had a fully covered tail. Here I have this vertical stabilizer together, and that was gonna be my test piece for putting decals on, just to make sure there was no issues. The cockpit glass has the traditional seam line down there running down the middle. I scraped it away with a brand new blade, sanded it with a 600 grit paper, and then 3000 grit Tamiya, and then polished it. I also like to paint the inside of my canopies just to give it a little bit more depth and realism. So here I'm just shooting some Tamiya flat black. I thought I'd left the fit issues behind with the fuselage, but the canopy glass is an issue as well. I had to remove the locating tabs on the windscreen just to get that to sit properly in the recessed area of the fuselage nose. So I was now committed to an open canopy because the canopy itself wouldn't now fit in that area. It was binding on the windscreen. One thing I did walk away from this build was realizing that I didn't like Vallejo putty anymore. And I'd actually tried a bit of perfect plastic putty and that was amazing. I highly recommend that for anybody and the Vallejo stuff is now in the trash. And the only thing I can fault the Vallejo putty for is when you come back in with water after it's dried, it comes away in chunks. So the perfect plastic putty didn't do that. And at the end of the day, that was my reasoning for this switch. Here I'm throwing down the Mr. Surfacer because we're ready to see some color on the actual aircraft itself. This kit gives you the option of having decals for the tail flashes and the vertical stabilizer flashes. However, I don't trust white decals on top of dark colors very much, so I chose to paint those flashes in just to save myself some trouble down the road. And at the end of the day, it turned out to be not necessary because those cartograph decals are extremely thick, and that presents some issues we'll get into in a minute here. However, there was no issue with paint bleed through on the white. As someone that normally builds matte finished World War II aircraft that don't have any shine, this presented another challenge because for the first time I had to do a paint that was going to have some shine to it and have a little bit cleaner finish. And to do that, I built up my white as my base coat to start with. So I did very thin layers and slowly built it up just so there was no edges to deal with. Because I was using this Frontline CF-18 B kit from Kinetic, I had to go online to get the Canada 150 kit instructions so I could get the masks and the placement of the decals. So what I did, I used my wife's Cricut machine after I had scanned the page to build a custom mask to apply to the frame. This gave me a nice clean finish and it saved me from trying to use a long white decal that also comes on the sheet. Once I had the white masked off, I brought in mission models, light ghost gray, to start building up more color to the aircraft. This is the first time I used Mission Models paint, and I actually really like those paints. When you thin them down a little bit, they go on nice and clean with very little texture if you're doing it at about 20 PSI. 
now that the gray and white are on, I'm bringing in the red. And again, it's just nice, thin, light layers and slowly building up the color. This is, to me, an X7 red, so it's a glossy finish. And at first, it looks kind of dull, but once you get more coverage, it starts to get a little bit of a shine to it. With the mask removed, it was now time to move on the biggest challenge of this kit, and that is the decals. Like I said earlier, I was very intimidated by the decals, but because I had no other choice at the time, I decided I was going to go for it. The decals for this kinetic kit were actually designed by a company in Calgary called Leading Edge Models. They've done a few Canadian aircraft decal kits over the years. They've just released the NORAD 60 livery that the demo jet was in last year from the Canadian Forces, and I also picked those up. So... You can count on them being very accurate. And then they were printed off by Cartograph. But in this case, what's weird for a Cartograph decal set is the decals are fairly thick. They're a thick printed decal and I had to use a lot of microsole and set to get them to sit properly. But to make them even more challenging, it's a thick decal, it's also very brittle, and on these lines where you can see the white of the Canada 150 logo, there's absolutely no carrier film to make those sturdy. It's just the line itself. So when you're handling these, you have to be very careful that you don't tear them because they tear very easily. There's no support to that duckle when you're laying it down. One thing that Kinetic included with the decal set is an extra white line you can use to touch up any issues or if things don't cleanly line up there is that backstop to maybe help you. What I would do different if I were to ever do this kit again, I would find to me a masking tape and just tape off the leaf itself. I would do that white leaf freehand. I wouldn't rely on the decals because it is very tedious to get that all lined up properly. While I'm applying the decals here, it's going to take a few moments. Why don't you make a comment in the set comment section of the video of what liveries you've liked on demo aircraft over the years, be it American, Canadian, British, whatever. For me personally, this is one of the best liveries that Canada has done for the, the Air Force. The only one that I think might have topped this a little bit would have been the Centennial of Flight one, which was the blue and gold aircraft. And it's actually now on display in the Museum of the Regiments in Calgary. So take a moment and let us know what you like on an aircraft. The RCAF usually has its aircraft designed and painted in Cold Lake, Alberta at the base. And there's one person who's been key in that in the last 20 plus years, and that is Jim Bulovo. He's usually in a either a consultant or directly involved with the designing of the livery. And sometimes he'll do 30, 40 attempts at a design before the final one is caught. And if you've seen his work on the jets, it's phenomenal. One problem that Kinetic has with its kits just falls down on instructions and what you'll find doing their kits is a lot of their stuff is not labeled correctly. I counted over 15 parts in their kits that were not labeled correctly, and that led to some issues when pre-painting items and pre-fitting them. You had to really double check the fit or else you'd find yourself in trouble. And one area where you're really going to get hammered for that is the landing gear bay doors. Another criticism as well is that these parts of the wings have nowhere to actually seat when you put them on. There's no positive lock there. You just kind of have to put on some glue and hope for the best that they angle properly. So again, test fitting and then best of luck is what will get you through it. With the remaining sections of the wings in place, it's now time to add the last few decals and get everything lined up. It was here that my wife wanted me to stop with the kit. She didn't want me to weather it or do anything else for 
markings because she didn't want me to ruin what she thought was a great looking aircraft she really loves the color red she's from scotland she's an immigrant to canada and she loved this aircraft so she didn't want me to mess with it or make it dirty unfortunately for her the realism of the canadian military is that this aircraft was pulled out of a unit it was painted but there are no other modifications made to the canadian demo jets they come from the frontline service and they are painted that's it and the reason for that is that if need be they can be pressed back into service with minimal interruption so long story short what happened to the canada 150 jet after the 2017 air show year it actually went back to cold lake still in its colors and continued in service wearing red so at maple flag 2018 the jet was still flying but was now shown its wear and tear so while doing this build, I chose to have a little bit of weathering to the aircraft because with it being clean and shiny, it just looked more like a toy than a model. So I actually decided to go with the 2018 look of the jet. Have no fear though, if you're a fan of the shine of the jet and that clean look, I do have plans to build the NORAD 60 livery on a Hasegawa bug. And I'm going to do it pretty much how it would look at the start of the air show year, just a tiny bit of weathering. For the false canopy on the bottom of the model, I decided to trace the decals onto Tamiya masking paper and fr basically paint them on. That way I could weather them a little bit and have a little more accurate color. Here I'm using my trusty RB Models stencil, splash stencil, just to add a little bit of weathering to the fuel tanks of the aircraft. One difference between the Canadian Show Hornets and other teams like the Blue Angels is the Blue Angels remove their gun from the aircraft, but Canadian doesn't. It's a frontline aircraft on the circuit. Kinetic chooses to mold their landing gear tires in three sections, their hub and then the outer halves of the tires. I'm not sure why they do that, but it requires a little bit of filling to have them look smooth. For any other Kinetic models down the road, I think I'll be getting some resin tires just to have to avoid that. I decided to go with blue practice palms on this kit just to add some contrast to all the red. And one thing the Canadian Hornets are always doing is carrying loadouts in a weird manner. So you'll see offset or asymmetric loadouts. And the reason for that is the targeting pod for the Hornet is carried on the left cheek of the intake. So what happens is if there's a fuel tank there, it can partially block. So you'll often see Hornets carrying a fuel tank on the right pylon a center tank, and then their ordnance on the left wing. As I stated earlier, the Kinetic kit has some beautiful detailing, and with the cockpit, the only aftermarket item I used was a harness set I had from a spare Hornet. And if you've seen Canadian Hornets in action, you know they're filthy once they've been on the line for a little bit. So here I'm just adding some oils and then some enamel thinner just to add sort of a filter on the tanks to make them look like they've been handled. I'll also repeat this process around the gear doors, inspection ports, anywhere that the crew will be handling the aircraft, especially where the pilot steps out from the cockpit. The nice thing about oil paints is they're very controllable, and if you don't like how something looks, you can come back in with a thinner, an enamel thinner, and just wipe it away and start again. That concludes this build video, and as always, if you liked it, subscribe, leave a comment, and if you didn't like it, leave a comment letting me know why. Uh, just to conclude this build, it is a very challenging kit, but at the end, if you can pull it off, it's very rewarding. This is the model guy, and I hope you enjoyed the build. Can't wait to put that in my video.